Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed action field information overload on this 7th of February, 2019. Are you enjoying our winter weather yet? Yes, winter has finally come to Minnesota. Uh, last week we had the polar vortex and it was really, really cold. And now we've got all of the, these uh, small little tiny ice chunks falling from space down to the earth and accumulating like you wouldn't believe. So yes, there is a pile of snow on the ground, but it's not that we haven't seen this before. This is just a normal winter, but we're going to ask the question, what comes next? On Saturday, or last week we had done our uh, Groundhog Day wrap up, but on Groundhog Day, Joe Bastardi from Weather Bell Analytics has gone through and given us a foretaste of the things to come. So we're going to take a look at his Saturday summary to show you what is on tap for the weather for February and March. Weather Bell Analytics meteorologist Joe Bastardi. Well, it's Groundhog's Day, and uh, you know I, I like that whole Groundhog's thing. It brings attention to the weather. I've been a keynote speaker out there, Punxsutawney, a couple of times, and it really is a very, very good time. But um, uh, the groundhog says that winter's over, and I beg to disagree. Now, uh, in the preseason, we gave you four analogs to look at for this winter. And we said uh, 2002, 2003, 06, 07. Um, uh, we went to 09, 10, and 14, 15. And the top two analogs have turned out to be 02, 03, 14, 15. But using those analogs, and they were based on research off what happened with the Southern Oscillation Index the previous winter. Using those analogs, we said that the November through January sea surface temperatures should look like this. All right, you see the warmth over here? So basically we take a method that was de developed from last winter, made a prediction of what the sea surface temperatures should look like. What did they actually look like? There they are, all right? So uh, this is turning out according to plan. So the diagnosis has been correct so far. Now, let's take the top two analogs, which are 0203, 1415. What did it say the month of November would look like? Well, it said it looked like this. What actually happened? Looked like that. What did it say December would look like? It said December would warm up. Uh, what did it look like? It warmed up in December. Said we start getting cold back into the weather pattern in January. Cold had started to come back into the weather pattern in January. What does it say? And, and take a look at the last 20 days, right? So this is, remember, it's warm to start January. Now, uh, what does it say going forward for, um, uh, for February into March? It says it's, there's going to be a lot of cold. So this warm-up that's coming is going to come and go. You see, here's the warm-up over the front five days. Look at the very cold air. You see in the 6 to 10, it's pushing. And then the 10 to 15, it's dominating the country. And that should run the table into March. All right, so... Uh, you can see the analogs that we're showing you to get us there. Look at all the snow forecasted here over the next 15 days. Now, how is this going to happen? Well, we get back to our old friend, the Madden Julian Oscillation. Southern Oscillation Index has been pretty close to neutral for the last 30 days. What you want to see is this to drop rapidly. Now, how is that going to drop rapidly? Well, when we look at the pressures across Australia being very low, and the other, the other uh, site that we look at over here is Tahiti. They're quite low. So you don't get a real big negative southern oscillation. If we want to move this pattern that we're in now, what we need is pressure rises all across Australia and pressure falls here. And when that happens, it'll kick the Madden Julian oscillation along and get it into the cold phases again. So what happens is you see the model by day 10, where it's pressure rises all over Australia negative here to the east, you're going to get a big drop in the Southern Oscillation Index. And once that happens, the MJO, which is in six and seven now, will move into phase eight, one, two, and three. And this is the holy grail of uh, cold weather during El Nino seasons, okay? So it's going to move into that. That's what we believe. Actually, the, the real correlation says that all it needs to do is come out of six and seven and into the null phase, but it looks like it's going to go into phase eight. You rotate uh, the MJO through phase eight, one, two, and three, and uh, we'll see what happens, okay? Now, there's been a lot of talk that, uh, you know, about climate change uh, causing this Arctic outbreak, 
And I, I want to show you something. I, I, the, the tropics and the energy in the tropics and in the ocean push everything around. They push the Arctic around. It's not the Arctic, oh, there's some sea ice melt uh, and all this. No. The amount of energy coming out of the Arctic is minute compared to what comes out of the tropics. So I want to show you something here. I've showed this several times. And for those of you who want to listen, you can listen. Okay? If you don't, you don't. There's nothing I can do about it. In 2018, this year, see that strong rotation of the Van Julian Oscillation in the 3 and 4? What happened? We got the severe Arctic outbreak. When we saw this going into 3 and 4 early in December, we immediately told our clients that first there'd be a big warm-up across the United States, and then after that, we, we get stratospheric warming that would cause the spread down and you get the polar vortex, a, a major cold air to come into the United States. Now, why does that happen? Well, if you warm the stratosphere, you're expanding the column. It means the troposphere contracts. So higher pressure builds for one. And for two, the air gets colder, right? When you expand a column of air, it's warming. When you contract, it's getting colder. It's not brain surgery. So we know when this goes into three and four, all these thunderstorms go off in the Indian Ocean, all right? They have a 10 to 15 day effect. It gets warm in the United States, but they also have a residual effect near and behind them in that the warming that is occurring across the Himalayas then spreads northeast where you get a major sinking air event going on in Asia. And when that happens, you see the warming going on in the stratosphere and then it spreads over top the pole. And this is exactly what happened. I'm going to show you. Okay, so let's go back to 1984, set up the big 1985 outbreak that if you've been following us here in Weatherbell, we've been talking about for two months how this was setting up like that. All right, there it is. See, it goes in, right? Now let's look at the 1993 event, late December 93, and of course January 94, the cold. There it is. It's right there. 2013, it went in a little bit earlier, but there it is in December again. Right, it went in, uh, so it, it's in there in December, and we had the major Arctic outbreak. So that three and four sets off stratospheric warming. The stratospheric warming then steps over the pole. So you look at December twenty fifth this year. Notice where the stratospheric warming is. Now eventually it gets right over top of the pole, and then the reactions uh, start. The blend of all those years I showed you, there it is, right there. See it, and so it's it's still see how they're. It's still cold near the pole, but then this spreads up. So what happens is the Madden-Julian Oscillation sets off all these thunderstorms in the Indian Ocean here, starts propagating across. The immediate effect in the United States is to try to promote warming, you know, 10 to 15 days down the road. But as this continues across, sinking air develops northeast of the Himalayas. And when, when the, air, the air subsides, it warms up in the stratosphere like that. And you get the stratospheric warming event that begins mid and late December and then spreads over top of the pole and then you get the outbreak. So and, and look, it's not brain surgery. You can there, right there, right there, right there, right there. It's it's <laughs> and, and so you gotta understand, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, you can ridicule me all you want. Hey, guys, you know, don't know what he's talking about. It. But look, this is this is just down in the ditch dirt digging, right? Why do I do this? Because I believe that the foundation you stand on today to reach for tomorrow was built yesterday. So if I can get hints from yesterday, I'm showing you all these analogs, I think I can beat the models or at least have an attempt at doing that okay and so when i see people that aren't even paying attention to this that aren't even looking at this and i see the tweets coming out and i see what people say none of them mention the njo mjo they're talking about climate change for this and that i'm skeptical right because i'm right in front of you i'm showing you what happened right <laughs> all right listen you gotta you gotta have a smile on your face a lot of bright people on both sides of this issue, right? But we have a lot of weather coming up, all right? I'm going to fight with fight with the cause for this. We try to explain the why before the what, telling you about it from back in December. We'll look out for this thing, right? I got to fight with a groundhog, all right? I'm a man of peace, 
All right. So I don't want to get into fights with anybody. I want everybody to enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you've got. And so that is your update on what has happened and what will happen and, uh, you know, th you know, things to come. I mean, what we're seeing now with the polar vortexes, what we're seeing with the amount of snowfall, it's not out of the ordinary. And yet there's so many people who want to pontificate that, oh, this is like the worst ever, but yet all you have to do is go back in history a little bit and you can see that there were, the, this is just a pattern. And that there are, as Joe Bastardi would say, whys before the what. And so I wanted to give you a little bit more uh, in-depth analysis. And I do this on occasion. I think I maybe even done it last week. Uh, just so you know that there is actually a science called meteorology, and it's not just a matter of looking at models and, and what does the computer tell me, and I have to just believe the computer. Um, because that's the way it goes. It seems to be the norm these days, but there is actually a science. And Joe Bastardi has been doing this long enough to figure it out. And uh, we figured that we'll show you uh, on occasion a little bit more as to the why before the what. Anyhow, the uh, weather this week did play havoc with a special election in north central Minnesota. Uh, yes, we are uh, with. Governor Tim Walls appointing uh, Tony Lorry as one of his commissioners. That meant that the state Senate seat in Senate District 11 became open. And it was a vacant seat, and that required a special election. So this faced uh, Tony Lorry's son, Stu Lorry, who would have been the third, uh, the third Lorry to hold that seat, versus... Jason Rarick, the state representative from the uh, 11B side of the Senate District. So how did things go? How did the weather impact on the special election? Who won? Well, Jason Rarick, the Republican, won the election against the third generation Lori. And here is what happened. New this morning on Sunrise, Republican Jason Rarick has won the special election in the state Senate District 11. Rarick beat out DFL newcomer Stu Lorry with 52% of the vote. That seat opened up when Democrat Tony Lorry, Stu's father, left to become Human Services Commissioner. Rarick's win gives the GOP a 35 to 32 seat majority in the state Senate for the next two years. Tony certainly knew this. And that, of course, was the very brief mention on CARE 11. Um, the seat was first held by Stu Laurie's grandmother, Becky Laurie, back in 1997. And then uh, it went from Becky Laurie, I think in 2012, when she ran in a uh, contested primary for the uh, right to challenge then Congressman Chip Kravak, that was eventually uh, Rick Nolan became the primary winner and he had uh, won that congressional race. So then uh, Tony Laurie ended up running for the state Senate seat that his mother had vacated. And now that Tony Laurie moved on, Stu, try, his son, tried uh, becoming the third generation. And yet it was the Republican Jason Rarick who ended up winning that election. Uh, nary a scat, uh, scat mentioning in most of the Twin Cities media. It's an afterthought. Um, the fact is, if Stu Laurie would have won, that's all we would have heard about is how the third generation Laurie is set to take office in the uh, state Senate seat. But that's how our Twin Cities media operates. Kind of expected that. Uh, but what does this mean for the future? It means another special election. Because Jason Rarick was an incumbent member of the State House of Representatives, that means his seat that he's vacating is now going to be up for grabs. And this is the area that encompasses uh, about 96% of Pine County. There's like four or five precincts in the uh, 11A side. And then about half of, of uh, uh, Cannabis County. So that's the area that is now going to be up for grabs in a special election. Per the state constitution, the governor will have to declare 
when that special uh, declare the special election and then the uh, according to the formula set forth in the constitution uh, it will be 35 days after his declaration so by the time that the election goes through a uh, tuesday's election goes through a canvassing committee uh, goes through the canvassing board and becomes certified then Rarick has to resign from the state house and then get sworn into the state senate and that's going to take a couple of days and then uh, after that it'll probably be another five days to a week before governor walls declares the special election and you get 35 days from there so consider that we are in the beginning of February right now, I expect to see the special election either at the end of March or the beginning of April sometime. So if you hear more down the road about a special election around that time, that's just because we have to have another one in order to fill the vacancy created by an incumbent House member winning a seat, a vacant seat in the state Senate. So that's kind of the news from there. And we do have one other piece of important Minnesota news, especially if you are a sports fan. Uh, yes, longtime Minnesota Vikings quarterback Wade Wilson passed away at age 60. Now, if you are a Vikings fan younger than 35 or even younger than 40, you may not remember Wade Wilson. If you are over 40, then you most certainly remember him from uh, his performance in the 80s and early 90s. So let's take a look at the video here. Uh, Dallas, go ahead and play these next two videos back to back. Tony certainly knew this man, and sad news from the Dallas Cowboys late this afternoon. Former quarterback and assistant coach Wade Wilson died earlier today. Wilson played for the Cowboys from 95 to 97. At that time, he was a backup to Troy Aikman. He was then quarterback's coach for the Cowboys from 2007 till 17. Long stretch. In the last 15 minutes, Cowboys legend Emmett Smith was on Twitter. He says, I am completely saddened by the loss of my former teammate, Wade Wilson. My thoughts and prayers and my heart go to him and his family during this time. Troy Aikman also tweeted just a little bit ago as well his thoughts. The Cowboys uh, said that Wilson apparently died at his home in Coppell today. The reason is unknown, but it also happened to be his 60th birthday today, Gilma. And mm -hmm. never knew the man, but I can tell you this, everybody around him has always had nothing but wonderful things to say about Wade Wilson. A lot of respect for him today. Yeah, it's, it, I think it's fair to say a pretty deep loss within the organization today. Now, one of Wade Wilson's teammates, Sean Salisbury, who later replaced him in the Vikings lineup as quarterback, took to Twitter to remember his friend. So let's see what Sean Salisbury had to say. All right, guys, I woke up this morning feeling really empty and still am, as I'm sure many of you are. And it reminds me how important it is to cherish the friendships, to let people know how important they are to you. As many of you heard yesterday, Wade Wilson passed away at 60 years old on his birthday of a heart attack. He was a dear friend, a teammate, he was a great family man, and just a great person. And I'm sure many of his teammates over 19 years can echo this as well. Wade had a great and uncanny ability to make you laugh when you didn't think you wanted to laugh and to kind of ease everything around you. Wade Wilson was a great man. I can remember one particular story uh, in the fall when I had got there in Minnesota. We were standing on a practice field, and you know you want to fit in, and 
I told Wade, yeah, but man, I threw for 4,000 plus yards and we won a Grey Cup in the CFL. And he looked at me and goes, yep, that was AAA. This is the big leagues. And we both laughed. And from then on, I knew I was home. Wade Wilson's one of the best people I know. And to the man we all call Whiskey, you're going to be missed. I hope you knew and know how much you meant to me. God bless you. God bless your family. And we'll see you on the other side, brother. I love you. And even though I said uh, Sean Salisbury took to Twitter, I meant that he took to Facebook because that was from his uh, Facebook account. So the Minnesota Vikings uh, family and community, you know, have a lot to mourn this week. Wade Wilson, I thought, was always one of the better ones. I'm not even a Vikings fan. I'm a Packer fan, folks. But I'll tell you this, when, when the Packers and Vikings would play, it was frustrating being a Packer fan watching my team get picked apart by Wade Wilson. But as a Packer fan, I also saw that he was a very talented quarterback who commanded my respect. And I think he commands the respect of everybody in the league. And then after he, leave, he left as a player, he became a coach, and he was Tony Romo's uh, quarterback coach back when Tony Romo was actually doing really, really good in the NFL. So Wade Wilson, he was a great guy. Never met him, but from those uh, uh, that I do know throughout the NFL, you know, they've said he's a great guy. And when you watch his highlight reel and when you uh, look at the, some of the quarterbacks that he mentored, he was, you know, one of the better ones out there. And he's definitely going to be missed within the Minnesota Vikings and the NFL community. Now we are going to start moving forward here uh, because we are now in the 2020 presidential election cycle. That means on the Democrat side there are going to be a lot of candidates who are uh, jumping into the race. Now one, we're, uh, two candidates we, we've briefly discussed, um, but so far uh, those that I know of without looking it up, we've got um, Elizabeth Warren. Not, I'm not going to bring her up today because we did cover her pretty extensively when she first announced. Uh, Kirsten Gillibrand from New York. Uh, we, we have one little biography segment on her. Uh, Kamala or Kamala Harris, however you pronounce her first name, Senator from California. Uh, we got a piece on her. New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, he's announced, and we got a small little piece on him. And then uh, there's a controversial piece about Tulsi Gabbard, the congresswoman from uh, Hawaii. Uh, she has now formally declared, but we did mention her briefly back when she had formed an exploratory committee. So now we're going to take a look right now at who is Kirsten Gillibrand, courtesy of the New York Senator, Times. Senator, lawyer, mother, children's book author and now Democratic candidate for president. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is in. I'm filing an exploratory committee for president of the United States tonight. Hailing from President Trump's home state of New York, she's joining what will likely be a crowded 2020 field. Which Democrats will run for president in 2020? The list is growing. It ranges from the Gillibrand is a former corporate lawyer and congresswoman. Growing up in a political family in Albany, she fell in love early on. I was drawn into politics when I was a little girl, and it was really with my grandmother who loved politics. She was appointed to replace Hillary Clinton in the Senate in 2009. Welcome, Senator. Gillibrand went on to win the seat again in a 2010 special election and has held it ever since. Over time, she has reversed her positions on immigration and gun control. You start off in a different place on immigration. Now you're more progressive on that. Mm -hmm. On guns, you started off, you know, more kind of pro-Second Amendment. Now uh, you went from having an, an A to an F, F. from yes. the NRA. I recognized that there was a lot of things I didn't know, and I should have been fighting for them before. She's now one of the party's most reliably liberal voices. Some of her priorities, a populist economic agenda, women's rights and gender equality, and fighting for victims of sexual assault with a focus on the military. Who is being held accountable for doing nothing since 2013? Who? Which commander? Gillibrand was the first senator in her party to call for the resignation of fellow Democrat Al Franken, following accusations of sexual misconduct. Enough is enough. Here she is during Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings. I want to really have Dr. Blasey Ford's back tomorrow, so I'm going to sit behind her. Not only do I support her, but I believe her. So what is her dynamic with President Trump? He said... She's just a puppet of humor. You know that. He put her there. He's also referred to her as a lightweight who would do anything for money. 
she responded this way. It was a sexist smear. It's part of the president's effort at name calling, and it's not going to silence me. Gillibrand has also voted against almost all of Trump's major nominees. I urge my colleagues, reject this bad choice. So what are her chances? Gillibrand is seen as a serious contender, but so far her poll numbers are low. Her next step, building a national profile and campaign. So I take a brief look, uh, now that you know a little bit about Kirsten Gillibrand, um, this is just going on to Wikipedia just to get some preliminary data here since I didn't really spend a lot of time with this. Uh, so far, Cory Booker, these are the candidates who have uh, jumped into the race for 2020 on the Democrat side. Cory Booker uh, announced his campaign on February 1st. Uh, Pete Buttig Buttigieg. He's going to have a hard, hard time with that name. Uh, Mayor of South Bend, Indiana. He formed an exploratory committee on January 23rd. Julian Castro, U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development uh, under uh, President Obama. He announced his uh, campaign on January 12th. Uh, Congressman John Delaney from uh, Maryland. He announced his campaign back in July 28th of 2017. Tulsi Gabbard, she announced her campaign January 11th. Kirsten Gillibrand has only formed an exploratory committee. She will at some point in time have an actual formalized announcement. Uh, Kamala Harris uh, announced her campaign January 21st. Elizabeth Warren, um, she announced, or she formed her exploratory committee on December 31st and then um, announced her announcement is coming up on February 9th. It's, it's pending. Um, and then we also have Michael Arth, an artist, builder, ar architectural designer, and political scientist. He's declared, uh, announced his campaign November 4th. These are the minor candidates. Uh, Harry Brown. Um, he's a 70-year-old... Uh, candidate for just about everything. Uh, he's considered a renewable energy consultant and researcher from Georgia. He announced his campaign December 7th of 2017. Uh, Ken Wodaik, a documentary filmmaker, motivational speaker, and peace activist from California, announced his campaign October 18th, 2017. Robbie Wells, a former college football coach, uh, announced his campaign on May 12th of 2018. Marianne Williamson, a spiritual author, a spiritual teacher, author, lecturer, entrepreneur, and activist, announced her campaign January 28th, 2019. And Andrew Yang, the entrepreneur and founder of Venture for America from New York, he announced his campaign November 6th, 2017. So you. <coughs> You have a lot of the minor candidates. We're really only going to focus on the ones who actually have a chance. And honestly, I don't see anybody in the second tier picking up enough traction to get through the Iowa caucuses. And I've been around political campaigns enough to know that the, the lower tier never really gets anywhere. Now, it's probably a good thing that they become candidates in the lower tier. It does get them some exposure. They do get a little bit of traction. That helps them for some other things, but to get into the upper tier or to become president, you really got to be upper tier to begin with. Trump. Trump was upper tier. Everybody knew who he was. Um, my producer just asked, what about Trump? Um, Trump came in with a presence, and that's the biggest thing is if everybody knows who you are, you're upper tier. If Jeff Bezos from Amazon decided he was going to run against Trump and become a Democrat nominee, he would be put into the upper tier because everybody knows him, or knows who he is and knows what he did. Uh, if um, Nora Slawick, the former mayor of Maplewood and currently the chair of the Metropolitan Council ran for president, she'd be my uh, lower tier because nobody knows who she is even though she's been in local government here in Minnesota for about 25 years. So that's kind of how the tiering system works. So now that you know a little bit more about the tier system, some of the candidates who have jumped into the race, we're going to now take a look at uh, Harris.
and her and who she is and a little more about what she's about. A barrier-breaking prosecutor with a love for grilling, question I will repeat, roasting, and music. Nation under a groove, getting down. California Senator Kamala Harris has joined the race for the White House. I am running for president of the United States, and I'm very excited about it. I'm very excited about it. So who is she? Harris has a history of being the first. Maybe the first to do many things, but make sure you're not the last. In 2010, she was the first woman and person of African and South Asian descent to become California's attorney general. I decided to become a prosecutor because I believed that there were vulnerable and voiceless people who deserved to have a voice in that system. And in 2016, she became the first black senator from California. So my question to you. Harris serves on four Senate committees and is perhaps best known for her tough questions. It makes me nervous. Is that a no? Is that a yes? Can I get to respond, please, ma'am? No, sir. No, no. She's moved to the left in recent years, but her political message remains broad, stressing unity and togetherness. We are all in this together. She has defended immigrants' rights, as well as public schools and Medicare for all. But her signature issue is criminal justice reform. Crime is not a monolith. We cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach to criminal justice policy. Critics on her left have called her record into question, arguing that she failed to embrace progressive reforms during her tenure as district attorney and California's attorney general. So what's her dynamic with President Trump? Harris has voted against more Trump administration nominees than most of her peers. She has called Trump's border wall his vanity project and the government shutdown crisis of leadership. For now, Trump has said little about her. So what are her chances? Political strategists believe Harris may be better positioned to build coalitions than some of her party rivals. A recent poll gave her an overwhelmingly favorable rating among Democrats. But as a relative newcomer to national politics, many voters may be waiting to hear more from Harris before making up their minds. And we're bringing this to you simply so you have a little bit of an awareness as to who the candidates are. Uh, we did this back in 2016, back in 2015 when they announced, uh, because that's politics. And I think that, you know, I'm trying not to give you my commentary because I have a completely different take on all the candidates. I'm trying to just dial my own personal feelings and opinions and analysis back and just let you get a chance to make your own, make up your own mind and we'll have plenty of time for me to interject my opinion and critique. So that was uh, Kamala Harris. Now let's take a look at Cory Booker, former mayor of Newark, New Jersey and the, and the current U.S. Senator from New Jersey. A headline-grabbing former mayor with a love of social media who says he's the only vegan in Senate history. Thank you for a vegan mecca. Senator Cory Booker is throwing his hat in the ring for President of the United States. I mean, this race to try to build our nation up. So, who is he? Cory Booker, nice move. Booker is a former college football player and Yale Law School graduate. Mayor Booker, for those who don't know, what's... He became a national figure as mayor of Newark by bringing in money and attention to the city. A $100 million challenge grant. And in 2013, he was elected to the Senate. Thank you, New Jersey! Booker is known for coming to his constituents' rescue, literally. The building next door is on fire. Yes, yes. And your first instinct was to go in? Yeah. He ran into the burning building and up the stairs. Also, his upbeat attitude. Lead with love. And his public speaking. This is about the closest I'll probably ever have in my life to an I am Spartacus moment. Some of Booker's priorities? So far, criminal justice reform. And he's also likely to focus on racial and gender equality and marijuana legalization. He's been in the Senate for a while, but he doesn't have many signature legislative accomplishments. Booker also has ties to Wall Street, something that might be an issue for the party's more progressive wing. So how has he taken on President Trump? Booker has been one of Trump's most aggressive critics in the Senate. And it is a failure. For Booker, the Trump so presidency poses a moral moment in our nation. But this approach may fall flat with Democrats, who are energized by their anger toward Trump. For his part, President Trump has said this. I mean, take a look at Cory Booker. He ran Newark, New Jersey into the ground. He was a horrible mayor. So what are his chances? So far, he's polling in the middle of the assumed pack but it's pretty early. Booker's been building a national profile for a while. He's already traveled to many states that could be key to winning the White House.
Well, of course, there's many things and many keys to winning the White House from, for a lot of people. The first thing, of course, is to get the nomination. And that was something that uh, was difficult on the Republican end. Uh, when President Trump became the nominee, he had to outlast 16 other rivals. And the same thing is shaping up on the Democrat side for the right to challenge Trump. The first thing is you got to make sure that you're known and respected and voted for within your party. And then you get to go against Donald Trump. So good luck to all of those candidates so far. And now we do have a piece on uh, Tulsi Gabbard. And before we want to show this piece, and if you've been following the show for any length of time, I do talk about the establishments within the parties. And it's important, I think, that we take a look at who's running the show here because this is a hit piece. We're going to show you a hit piece. This is put up by the Washington Post. The uh, New York Times did the other three. Um, Tulsi Gabbard, congresswoman from Hawaii, Democrat, announced for president, and now is being attacked. Now, why? Ask yourself, why is she being attacked so soon? You know what the answer is? She upset the Clintons. Yeah, the Clintons? Yes, because she, Tulsi Gabbard, supported Bernie Sanders for the nomination back in 2016. And therefore, there is no way the Clintons are going to let Tulsi Gabbard come anywhere close to becoming the nominee if they can help it. And so here we have a piece from the Washington Post about how Tulsi Gabbard is a controversial 2020 candidate. I'm going to bring this up because there's one other, per, one other person who may be seen as a threat to the Clintons, and that would be Minnesota's own Amy Klobuchar, who is planning on announcing on, I believe it's Sunday, uh, let's see, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, yeah, Sunday, Sunday, she's announcing that she's going into uh, putting her hat into the ring uh, for the 2020 nomination. And already we, were seeing, we saw a hit piece on Amy Klobuchar that came out of the Huffington Post this week, uh, pretty much just about the high staff turnover in uh, Klobuchar's Senate office and that she's really, really demanding and tough to work for and is not necessarily well liked by the people who work for her and that... Uh, what was the other thing out of the piece? Oh, that um, as a as a uh, U.S. senator, she has bent the Senate ethics rules on having staff do personal errands. It's, I think every senator and every member of Congress at some point in time has, hey, if you're running over there, can you pick me up, pick up this? My dry cleaning is done there, and if you're uh, going to lunch at the place next door, can you swing by? I mean, st stuff as innocuous as that can actually become a controversy if people want to be stick with to the rules, and they usually do that if you oppose them. So I haven't taken a look at uh, Amy Klobuchar's past dealings with Bill or Hillary Clinton uh, or, and that could even be, you know, the Obama team. The Obama establishment might have put out the hit piece on, uh, on Amy Klobuchar. Um, but Klobuchar, by next week, will be in the race. I give it about 95% probability. In the meantime, take this with a, a grain of salt, knowing full well that this is politics as usual. This is the stuff that goes on. And I know we're going to be hearing more about the internal tearing down of other Democrats by Democrats, from Democrats for Democrats. Because votes are at stake for the right to run against Donald J. Trump for president. So let's take a look at the piece. <laughs> I have decided to run and will be making a formal announcement within the next week. Representative Tulsi Gabbard, a Democrat from Hawaii, announced January 11th that she will run for president in 2020. The 37-year-old was the youngest person ever elected to Hawaii State Legislature when she was just 21. She was also the first Hindu member of Congress. Gabbard fought in Iraq with the National Guard before winning her 2012 congressional race in Hawaii's 2nd District. She serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and has been a critic of foreign military intervention. The U.S. must end its support for Saudi Arabia and stop waging interventionist wars that increase destruction, death, and suffering around the world. Some on the left view Gabbard skeptically. The congresswoman has raised concern among Democrats in the past 
when she criticized Obama's strategy on Iran, ISIS, and Syria. The administration is misidentifying the enemy and their motivation. A small body of determined spirits. She resigned as vice chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee in 2015 to endorse then-presidential candidate Bernie Sanders. Gabbard was one of a handful of Democrats who met with President Trump during his presidential transition, reportedly to discuss a national security job in the administration. She also caused controversy and alienated some Democrats when she met with Syria's President Bashar al-Assad in 2017. I believe that if we profess to care for the Syrian people, if we want to end the suffering for them, we have to be willing to meet with whomever we need to. As a state politician in Hawaii, Gabbard opposed legalizing civil unions for same-sex couples and has a history of unsupportive comments toward the LGBT community. She has since recanted those positions and expressed reform in her views on LGBT rights. RT, the Russian-funded news network, has published flattering articles on Gabbard, triggering comparisons to the Russian propaganda which helped boost Trump's 2016 campaign. Notice that the fact that RT, hey, we've used RT stuff on this show. They actually do better journalism than a lot of the uh, bigger players in the media do today, I mean, in America. So the fact that RT decides to do something positive about uh, Tulsi Gabbard in announcing her candidacy, then all of a sudden we have to do these, this uh, RT Russian collusion type of stuff. You see what I mean about being a partisan hit job? That's what this is. And I did take a look during that segment. Um, Amy Klobuchar did endorse Hillary Clinton for 2016. So. Uh, I don't think then that this would have come from uh, the, the Klobuchar hit piece, and I might even talk about that next week if I remember, depending on what happens this week in the news. Um, the fact is, um, we'll take a look more at Amy Klobuchar and her presidential nomination uh, again after she announces on Sunday. So that's it from that political wrap up. Now. Uh, and, and this is on election 2020. Now, let's go back just a little ways because we did actually have a Prager University segment this week, and that's kind of a lead into that. This is a lead into why Trump won. Notice that here we are trying to get Tulsi Gabbard and the Russians and that whole, the, the whole cloud over Tulsi Gabbard. Why? Because I think that a lot of people in the establishment wings of the Democratic Party view Tulsi Gabbard as a threat, that she actually could win the nomination and might even be the one to beat Donald Trump. And this is something I've even predicted a lot long ago. If the Democrats nominate one person who could give Donald Trump the biggest fit and possibly overthrow him would be Tulsi Gabbard. And I also think that that's the reason why she's going to get a lot more criticism and a lot more exposure than uh, the other uh, negative attention than the other candidates. And that's why I don't think she's going to get the nomination. Uh, because I think that uh, a, a Democrat female veteran who has experience in the U.S. House, who has some foreign policy experience, who has some domestic policy experience, who actually has a good head on her shoulders, would threaten Donald Trump. I think enough independent voters would vote for Tulsi Gabbard, and that's going to, that would going to make matters difficult for Trump. But that also means Tulsi Gabbard comes out more independent than the Democrat establishment that cannot control her. And that's the problem that they're having with Donald Trump right now. They cannot control Donald Trump. The Republican establishment has problems in not being able to control Donald Trump. Trump is going to be Trump. But that is one of the reasons why Donald Trump won. So we're going to take a look at the Prager University analysis as to why Trump won. And we'll see how this uh, stacks up with everything else that you know about him and the race for 2020. I was elected to the Parliament of Canada seven times, three times as prime minister. I did not expect Donald Trump to be elected president of the United States. But unlike most observers, I did think it was at least possible. Why? Because I sensed, as Mr. Trump surely did, that the political landscape had shifted. The underlying issue is this. Over the last few decades, thanks to globalization, a billion people, mostly in the emerging markets of Asia, 
have lifted themselves out of poverty. This, of course, is a good thing. Yet in many Western countries, the incomes of working people have stagnated or even declined over the same period. In short, many Americans voted for Donald Trump because the global economy has not been working for them. We can pretend that this is a false perception. We can keep trying to convince people that they misunderstand their own lives. Or we can try to understand what they are saying and offer some solutions. I prefer the latter approach. Let me begin with this. In our contemporary world, there are, as British journalist David Goodhart describes it, those who can live anywhere and those who live somewhere. Imagine you work for an international bank, computer company, or consulting firm. You can wake up in New York, London, or Singapore and feel at home. Your work is not threatened by import competition or technological dislocation. You vocally support all international trade agreements and high levels of immigration. You're one of those who can live anywhere. There are a lot of those people, but there are a lot more completely unlike them. Let's say you're a factory worker, small business person, or in retail sales. Your work has been disrupted by outsourcing, cheap imports, and technological change. Your children attend the local schools and your aging parents live nearby. Your social life is connected to a local church, sports team, or community group. If things go badly at your company, or if policy choices by politicians turn out to be wrong, you can't just shift your life to somewhere else. Like it or not, you depend on the economic policies of your national or state government. When it doesn't come through for you, you're not happy. And when it ignores you entirely, you get angry. It's easy for anywheres to dismiss these concerns. But the anywheres faith in global solutions and multinational political bodies is founded more on fantasy than fact. The fact is, the critical functions of laws and regulations and monetary and fiscal stability, among other things, are provided by nations, not global institutions. The nation, with all its flaws, is a concrete reality. The global community is little more than a concept. Yet it is the anywheres, with their faith in globalization, not the somewheres, who have dominated the politics of almost every advanced country. That is, until now. This sea change is not limited to the United States. The same dynamics, anywhere elites versus somewhere populace, is playing out across the Western world. These populists, as I've tried to show, are not the ignorant and misguided deplorables depicted in mainstream media. They are our family, friends, and neighbors. The populists represent, by definition, the interests of ordinary people. And in a democratic system, the people are supposed to be our customers. So how then can we best serve them? I propose an approach I call populist conservatism. Grounding ourselves in tried and true conservative values, we must speak to the issues that concern the somewheres and their families, those of ordinary people, not elites. Those issues include market economics, trade, globalization, and immigration. In addressing these issues, conservatives should remain pro-free market, pro-trade, pro-globalization, and pro-immigration. Going in a completely opposite direction in any of these areas is a mistake. But being pro-market does not mean that all regulations should be dismantled or that governments should never intervene to protect workers. Being pro-trade does not imply that every trade agreement is a good one. Being pro-globalization should not entail abdicating loyalty or responsibility to our country and our local communities. And being pro-immigration should never mean sanctioning illegal immigration, erasing our borders, or ignoring the interests of our citizens. I call this populist conservatism, but it's really just conservatism. Conservatism is about seeing the world as it is. It's also inherently populist, because it is about serving real people rather than theories. I'm Stephen Harper, author of Right Here, Right Now, Politics and Leadership in the Age of Disruption for Prager University. And there is a lot of truth to that segment, a lot of truth because when President Trump went down the escalator when he announced his candidacy, it was the forgotten man, as he said in his inaugural address, that he was concerned about. It was the American worker, 
It was the amount of money that we were taking in from tax collections, uh, or, you know, from uh, tariffs. Uh, and, okay, I got that one wrong. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, it's the global trade, and, and we, we've discussed this before. I mean, even Lee Iacocca was, had highlighted a trade war 30 years ago. Hey, we're at a trade war with Japan. He wrote that in, uh, uh, was it Talking Straight, uh, a book that he wrote if he was going to run for president, which he never did. Uh, so he wrote a book instead. If I were going to run for president, this is what I would run on. We were at a trade war with Japan. That was at that time. That was before the Japanese economy collapsed. But since then, we've been at a trade war with Japan, with uh, China. And so that was one of the issues. Immigration was an issue that Iacocca brought up in 1988. And immigration is illegal immigration, unlawful immigration. That is what Donald Trump is talking about. That is what the people here in the United States are concerned about. We are concerned about declining wages. Take a look at the job listings. Even if you have a job and you're not unemployed, go to temp agency websites, go to Indeed. Find out who's hiring for what. And you know what? There's a lot of low-wage jobs out there. A lot of them. But what it's going to take is more demand on a labor force to get those wages up. And that's why we spend so much time trying to worry about what the unemployment rate is. The lower the unemployment rate is, that's when you start having a labor demand. You have a labor shortage. That means companies then have to raise their way, rates to attract the employees that will do the work for them. And the longer we have had illegal immigration running rampant, those wages have been suppressed. And then you add on government policies that have created inflation. I remember the uh, time when my father discovered that a half gallon of ice cream was actually uh, like 0.33, um, uh, 33 percent of a gallon instead of 50 percent of a gallon. Uh, yeah, and he's like, well, the same price. They shrunk the portion sizes to combat inflation. The American worker has felt hosed for so long. Donald Trump came along promising them that we will have positive economic growth under his administration. And that is exactly what he has delivered on in the first two years. So now that brings us to our final point today. We have the State of the Union address. The long delayed State of the Union address. And with that, before we give, give you some highlights, there's two important things, I think they're important as a historian, that Trump made mention to. So the first one is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. He brought that up early on in his speech. Let's take a look. In 2019, we also celebrate 50 years since brave young pilots flew a quarter of a million miles through space to plant the American flag on the face of the moon. Half a century later, we are joined by one of the Apollo 11 astronauts who planted that flag, Buzz Aldrin. Thank you, Buzz. This year, American astronauts will go back to space on American rockets. And President Trump also paid homage to the 75th anniversary of D-Day that's coming up this summer. Let's take a look. This year, America will recognize two important anniversaries that show us the majesty of America's mission and the power of American pride. In June, we mark 75 years since the start of what General Dwight D. Eisenhower called the Great Crusade, the Allied liberation of Europe in World War II.
On D-Day, June 6, 1944, 15,000 young American men jumped from the sky, and 60,000 more stormed in from the sea to save our civilization from tyranny. Here with us tonight are three of those incredible heroes. Private First Class Joseph Riley, Staff Sergeant Irving Locker, and Sergeant Herman Zaitchek. Gentlemen, we salute you. Members of And with that, of course, would be the natural time for highlights of the State of the Union Address. <laughs> but guess what? We're out of time. So what does that mean? What does that mean? First of all, as somebody who studied both military history and space history, I was really, really gratified to see Buzz Aldrin get his due and to be able to see the D-Day veterans get their due. Uh, that, was, that was always um, special when these folks uh, are properly recognized. Unfortunately, uh, Michael Collins wasn't there. Michael Collins was on uh, the command module pilot for Apollo 11. It would have been nice to see him. But to my understanding, he has not been of the best of health in the last uh, year, and so that could have been one of the reasons why he wasn't there. But still, uh, to be at the State of the Union address marking the 50th anniversary of Apollo and the 75th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, I really have to give the president some uh, props for that. And yes, if President Obama would have done this, I would have given the same props to Obama, uh, simply because I do believe that uh, these people do re uh, have earned their, that recognition. We are not going to go through highlights of the State of the Union address today because, actually, I didn't even get a chance to watch the entire speech. Uh, that was when the results were coming in from Senate District 11 special election. I felt at that time that I can always go back and review the State of the Union address. I just haven't had a chance to do that yet, but it's snowing out, so I might just do that tonight. Uh, in the meantime, what we are going to do is leave you with the United States Army's band, Pershing Zone, with Hail to the Chief. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.